Okay, so let's just... Okay, so today my talk is on creating a text-to-speech system in Rust. And with this talk, we have a completely open source text-to-speech system. It's going to be great. But first off, let's just do the initial stuff. I hope everyone's having a great conference. It's been great talking and like seeing so many of like all of you. And big shout out to Ernest for organizing this. I don't know how he does it. Man's a hero. And for me, I'm a programmer at Emotech, an AI startup primarily using Rust for our services, not Python, Rust. I also, like, we work in speech technologies, related areas. We do text-to-speech, speech-to-text. We do lip-sync, which is taking in text of people speaking and generating 3D facial animations. And we're also hiring, I have been told to mention that by our HR person, so obligatory advert over. I'm also XD009642 online, which is maybe a bit of a hard name to remember, but you can also find me via my big open source project, Cargo Tarpaulin, an open source code coverage tool. Now, this talk is going to introduce TTS systems, the challenges, and it's going to cover all stages in the pipeline. So that's from characters and text coming in to audio coming out. And like I said, we have a fully open source text-to-speech engine and two accompanying libraries, one of them which we use in production. And with this, you'll be able to take my code, and you'll be able to turn text into speech on your very own computers. So why Rust? Well, sometimes AI systems need to be real-time. We care about latency. People care about this a lot in speech. There's a lot of talk about real-time factor. And we need to be handle concurrent load from users. And Python breaks pretty quickly in this scenario. I don't know if anyone here has done speech before, but if you have, Caldi is probably a familiar and terrifying name. It's a C++ library, and this is what the majority of like ASR, so speech to text, the opposite end round, it's what the majority of those systems were written in. They weren't using TensorFlow and PyTorch. They were using Caldi and researchers and C++. They're not engineers, and there are some issues. So we want our researchers to be able to help us on these systems. We want to work on them, and we want confidence in production, which is why we pick Rust. And also in text-to-speech land, there are some people still using HTK, which is a hidden Markov model toolkit. Um, once again, it's a C-based system, and these things are hard to use, and they do come with safety issues that can be seen in production. So what's hard about text-to-speech? Well, language is hard. We have unknown words. You will train your system, and then you'll come, and someone will create a new company called some word that you've never seen before, and you have to figure out how to say that. You have homographs, so words that sound the same. Lead, lead, bass, bass. And you have code switching. This is more of an issue in foreign languages, but if you do something like Arabic text-to-speech, which we do, you'll find that customers often put English words in, often proper nouns or certain words. Um, no one's ever bothered trying to translate Kubernetes cluster to Arabic. They just say Kubernetes cluster in the middle of a sentence. So you have to deal with changing of the language and identifying that. You also have to think about how the speech sounds. In text-to-speech, we're constantly balancing between two things. We have naturalness. We have if it sounds like a real person talking, how natural it sounds. But we also have intelligibility. Text-to-speech is used for accessibility systems, like screen readers, and for things where people need to be able to understand the speech better to communicate and interact with us all. So you do have to think about what your system is targeting. Are you targeting accessibility needs, or do you want to just really sound like a human being? And also, you want to be able to control things. People want to be able to control volume, speed, they want to be able to tweak all manner of things, add pauses into the speech. So we all need ways to do these things. And that's what makes text-to-speech challenging. So now I'm just going to go over a bit of how we've done things in the past. So we've done formant, synthesis. And what a formant is, is it's a resonant frequency in the vocal tract. And by taking all of those resonant frequencies in our vocal tract, we can add them together and we can make sounds. This is how the very first systems worked. And they essentially tried to create a mathematical model of your entire vocal tract from your lungs to your lips and everything that moves in the middle. And then do things like when someone makes a t sound, 
how do these things change? How do these signals change? So they're really hard to make, they're very fast, they sound robotic, but they are so intelligible, they're so easy to understand. You don't get like issues that you might get with neural network systems where it's learnt to uh, mimic all the stupid things that we do when speaking, which makes things harder to understand. But it's incredibly low level, so it's very hard to develop. And that's part of why these systems have fallen out of practice, because you do need to work so, so hard to just get fractional gains and like how good it sounds. We have concatenative synthesis, which has a very easy to understand name from it. You're just taking bits of audio and you're just gluing them together. So what we have is a database of audio samples or units. These are normally subword units because we don't want to keep every word in the English language. We usually use phonemes or groups of phonemes and we join them together. They sound incredibly natural, but at the points when you join, Obviously, you're, that's a cut, in a sense. So a lot of work in these systems is smoothing over these joins. And these are good, but a lot of data, and they have their own challenges. We have hidden Markov model-based synthesis. This is actually what I initially wanted to do the talk on, but it's very hard to do. It's based on a statistical model that is spatial-temporal, so it is a statistical distribution over time. It was state-of-the-art pre-deep learning. There are some versions of it that, mod that like, utilize some deep learning for parts of the hidden Markov model. And duration modeling is tricky. So a hidden Markov model kind of assumes that every Markov state lasts the same amount of time. But when I speak, every acoustic unit that I'm speaking does not last the same amount of time. So you have to find ways to trick the statistical like, model into doing that. And that was one of the things that made this hard. It does work really well in languages which have a more consistent timing than, or a different type of timing, I should say, than English. So you will still find it sometimes actually used in Japanese text-to-speech systems. There are still universities doing that. And then there's deep learning, of course, what everyone expects to hear in an AI talk, neural networks. These tend to be in two flavors. You either have it, you put the text straight in and audio comes straight out or you generate a spectrogram, and then you have a vocoder which turns the spectrogram into audio. Now, our system, we're going to be doing this spectrogram vocoder system. We're going to have text normalization, spectrogram generation, and vocoding. And these are essentially the sections of this talk. But first, what is speech? Who knows? Well, hopefully we'll all know at the end of this. So fundamentally, we can break speech down into different subunits. We can break it into letters, which the linguistics community call graphemes. We can break it into syllables, that's each individual sound in the word. So you can think of it as the beats of the word, like syllable has si, la, bo. And I'm teaching you all how to suck eggs right now. You have phonemes, that is a language-specific sound that forms words. So this is a bit more of an understanding of the language. So can is one syllable, but it has k, a, n phonemes. And then we have phones, which are smaller. So in the English language, tap and hit, the T sounds are different. They're different phones. But linguistically, these are the same sound in English. We don't distinguish the, between them like linguistically. They will never change the meaning of something. It's just based on where it is in the word. You have co-articulation when you go from one phoneme to another the sounds will kind of bleed into each other and you will get different sounds. Now, we don't tend to use phones, at least in text-to-speech, but they're kind of the lowest level sort of feature you can get in speech. Now, with phonemes, which are what we're going to be using, spoiler, um, they're really useful. You can get phonetic transcriptions of things. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet. When you go on Wikipedia and it tells you how to pronounce the article name, it's given in an IPA string. Now, IPA is super common, but we're going to be using ARPABET. ARPABET is an American English phoneme model, which was popularized in the speech community with CMU Dict and initial speech research. CMU Dict is open source, and it's a phonetic dictionary of common English words at the time. Now, the advantage of phonemes is we're unambiguous. We turn the text into smaller units. We don't have to think about, is this a silent letter? You know, what sounds are we making? We've described what sounds we're making explicitly. 
Now, sometimes end-to-end deep learning systems won't use these. Uh, personally, I think that's, as the youth would say, an L take, like that's pretty bad. You can't control pronunciation. You will hit words that your system has never seen, and you will pronounce them wrong. So you need to be able to give users the ability to tune that pronunciation. Well, is that it? Well, no, there's more to speech than the sounds you make. There's also prosody, so this kind of comes for rhythm, intonation, pitch, and this differs language to language. So Mandarin is a tonal language. The tone of the words changes the complete meaning of it. Now, English, we do use tone actually to symbolize things, but we use it more of a, say, grammatical construct. We use a rising inflection as a question. This is a way that we use pitch in English to signify the meaning of the sentence. We also have the timing of words. So English is stress-timed. There is an equal amount of time between stresses in your speech. And part of English intelligibility is putting the stresses in the right place. If people put stresses in the wrong place or they don't time the stresses properly, it makes it harder as an English speaker to listen and understand what they're saying. This is kind of what we talk about in language learning when it comes to fluency. Mandarin is syllable-timed. Um, some of the Romance languages are syllable-timed. There's Mora-timed, which is pretty much just a Japanese thing. Um, if anyone wants to know, I can tell them at the end what that is, but we're not going to dive too much into other languages. And now we can actually start doing our TTS system. So, text normalization. We want to convert the text from the written form to the spoken form. Written text is ambiguous. Um, it's so we need to normalize it. We need to actually move it how we want the TTS to say it before we do anything else. Now, traditional systems were rule-based. Linguists tried to make like big decision trees telling you how to change things. There are models for it. Uh, Groot, or Groot, however you say it, G-R-U-U-T, is a popular model, which is a mixture of rule-based and hybrid, I believe. Now, hybrid systems are good because they let you do a bit of customization. They let users be able to add their own rules or something. And I kind of went for a simple rule-based approach because I don't want to be training too many models. I did have a limited amount of time to do this talk. And I do have to shout out Unicode segmentation and the de-Unicode crates. Uh, we do have to handle Unicode, and these crates are necessary tools in your toolbox doing this type of processing in Rust. So for the challenges, we have to identify some level what each token is. We need to tell how to read numbers, like that number, is it a year? Is it 1971? Is it 1,917? Is it 1,971? Like, is it a PIN number? It's not a PIN number. Well, it's someone's PIN number, it's not mine. Is a sequence of capital letters an initialization or shouting or a word? Um, the Saudi smart city, NEOM, they write it in all capitals, but they don't want you to go N-E-O-M, they want you to go NEOM. Now, this gets a bit complicated. Can we just get users to do it? Like, I don't want to do work. I just want users to do things, right? Well, luckily, there's a W3C standard for this, SSML. It's an XML standard, speech synthesis markup language, and you can use XML tags to give instructions to a text-to-speech engine. Also, as someone who's worked on a system that didn't have it and then we had to bring it in, you should be bringing this in from day one because it will drive your normalization, it will make it easier, and if you try and bring it in retrospectively, you have to do a lot of refactoring and like, you're going to kind of hate yourself for not like, thinking more about things earlier on. So here I have some example SSML. I have one pecan. We can show that it adds a break. It's told you how to interpret the number, and it's given a phonetic transcription. You can do other things like speed, volume. Um, you can specify which language if you're changing the language during audio. There's even some stuff to like add in audio files and play them because they're initially thinking about using this in websites for like accessibility things or like as subtitling solutions. So we have SSML. So we're going to do SSML parsing and normalizing. And this is the first bit of Rust code. I'm not going to show you all the code, but I work with researchers, and one of the things which I didn't expect when going into things, so we've all seen Rust denums. We can attach data to them. That's brilliant. Our researchers are new to Rust. They're coming from Python or C++, and they're not used to pattern ma matching or languages with pattern matching. So we found one pattern they were trying to do a lot was doing like 
cloning the enum to like, try and extract and compare the value because they couldn't just compare with the quality. So we tend to do a simpler enum without the data attached, and we give them a method which then lets them do a quality to compare. This is a bit easier than like, having them add so many unnecessary clones or doing weird things with if let to try and like, compare enums because they don't know pattern matching yet. And it sort of it gives them an easy mode to do Rust. And that's important. Like, it'd be great if they could just stay in their research land and chuck things over the fence and we can do it. But that's not a great way to do a project. We want to be collaborative. So that's just a little aside on the code. But even if we do SSML, we still have to normalize. We have to, so the approach I've gone in the code, which you can all check out afterwards, is I turn the output into a list of chunks. These are either text, phonemes, or state changes for the TCS, like applications of like pitch changes, breaks, pauses. For the text, we split it into words, grab the punctuation, normalize each word. I don't keep any major context. There's a bit of context around numbers, just to try and get them roughly right. But I don't handle things like bass and bass and trying to figure out which one's the right one. Uh, Rule-based systems for that don't work. They're really bad. Like You should just train a model to do it. Um, in the future, I might do like an open source model just to demonstrate better, but there's stuff in Python that anyone can look up if they want. And we've done all this, and we have our dictionary, and that's all great. Dun, dun, dun. No. So we've taken our dictionary, we've got things to phonemes, but in the system, like I said, there will be unseen words. So there's not one in my TTS system yet, maybe in the future. We'll see, but we would use G2P systems, grapheme to phoneme. So these models would traditionally assume that each letter goes to like one phoneme, and they're trying to add like padding null phonemes to make things line up one to one. But these approaches don't work very well, and you can kind of see here with the word accuse. Like I have the phonemes at the bottom, I have the letters at the top. Two letters map to one phoneme, one letter maps to two phonemes, one letter maps to nothing. Um, you do need to use like more modern sequence-to-sequence -sequence models or things like CRFs or HMMs to do things. You need to be able to do things that can handle with unaligned sequences and statistically learning the alignment if you want the best results. So we've got our phonemes, and now we're going to generate a spectrogram. So why do we generate a spectrum? Why don't we just generate audio? Like, we want to listen to audio. We don't want to like, look at pictures of audio. Come on, guys. So the more you constrain a problem, the easier it is to train a neural network, and the less data you need. A spectrogram is an incredibly compressed representation of audio. We've quantized it on the time scale to like, whatever our time window is, say like 60 hertz or whatever, like 0.01 seconds a frame. And we've quantized it based on frequencies. And because of that, we can massively reduce the amount of data, give the neural network an easier structure to learn, and then require less data for training. Generally, with these type of models, you can avoid like, the big open AI approach of like, just throwing the entire internet at it if you're smart about the representation of your data and just trying to like, really push things in the right direction. Now, this is like part of the skills of like, working in data science and machine learning engineering. It's figuring out a way to guide the model to the right solution, either through architecture or data engineering. Now, we're going to use a specific, uh, a specific type of spectrogram called a MEL spectrogram. So the MEL scale is a pitch scale that's designed on human perception, so every tone sounds equidistant. So it loses resolution outside the ranges of human hearing, and it has the most sort of data where our hearing is strongest, which is in the range of a human voice, because we are designed to listen to each other. And this sort of ends up for frequencies then binning them further into different buckets, so we've compressed the data even more. And we've kept it to the stuff that we're interested in, like where human speech exists. If we've recorded our data with the same microphone, we will have the same high frequency noise or crackle, and we don't want the neural network wasting time learning the noise profile of our microphones. We want to focus on the important bits of the data. So this is, again, once more how we constrain the feature space down more to train more useful models with less data. And the model we're going to be doing is Tacatron 2. 
So this is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model published in 2018. What sequence-to-sequence -sequence means is it takes a sequence of inputs and generates a sequence of outputs. It's no longer state-of-the-art, but it can run on CPU and my old laptop, and like, that generally makes it accessible. I don't want to force anyone to buy like an NVIDIA GPU to try and run the demo. That would be unethical of me. And we're going to do something more interesting with our neural networks. And in this project, I avoided using PyTorch or TensorFlow because well, everyone uses that. It's a bit boring. And it lets us look more at the Rust ecosystem and what people are doing in the machine learning space. And also things that could potentially run on more devices, including edge compute or embedded devices, because there are runtimes like Tract which are suitable for that. And because of that, we exported the neural network to Onyx. This is an open neural network exchange. It's an open standard designed to make it easier to run neural networks and share them between like different frameworks. But as a relative outsider, the adoption feels poor and the ecosystem feels lacking. When it works, it's great, but there's limited support, even in Torch and TensorFlow, like then not great. Everything Torch can actually generate invalid Onyx in some cases, which sucks in its own way, but you just kind of get around this stuff when you work with machine learning code. It's all held together with like bits of string and elastic bands, like ultimately. Now, the best native Rust support is in Tract, which I mentioned, but the general best support in the ecosystem is the Onyx runtime, which is done by Microsoft, and ORT are the bindings to that, and it's pretty much fully featured. If you work with Onyx, I've got a list of useful tools. There's Netron that allows you to visualize the graph. You want to be able to look at the nodes, how things connect, what the dimensionality is of your inputs, what your input names are, what your output names are. There's an Onyx optimizer crate, which I think is actually like they're no longer working on it, but it can optimize your graphs if your Onyx library doesn't have a graph optimizer. And NVIDIA have released a lot of Onyx tools. So Graph Surgeon lets you basically hack around with Onyx graphs with Python, remove nodes, change nodes, do all this sort of neural network introspection and messing around, which can help you get past some compatibility issues in the ecosystem. So going back to compatibility issues, a recurrent theme with neural networks, it seems, the Tacitron 2 Onyx export splits the network into three subnetworks. And this is because there are general nodes which most things don't support, and they don't support well. They also have an Onyx exporter for the vocoder that comes with Tacitron 2, but it actually crashes whenever I try and run it in their Docker image. So something's gone wrong there. I'm not quite sure what but we're not using their vocoder anyway, spoilers, so it doesn't matter. Now, in the pure Rust corner, we've got Tract. So this is the best Onyx support in the ML ecosystem. It's missing loop blocks, which they are planning on adding them at some point. PR's welcome. Um, so that's fine. They're missing dynamically sized inputs, but that doesn't matter too much. Uh, when you export a model from Torch, you do something called JIT tracing, and that fixes all the input sizes. It can potentially perform some optimizations, like Tract in its main branch has optimizations, but I don't know if they do any optimizations in Tractonics or how far they are. And it has a real-time factor of 300 on Hello World from Rust, my default te test string. A uh, real-time factor of 300 means if the audio is one second, it will take 300 seconds to generate. So that's not real-time, but Tract was designed for like the Sonos smart speaker and doing like wake word detection, which is a much smaller neural network and much simpler design. So this is probably just picking slightly the wrong tool for the wrong job a little bit. Um, and I have some example tract code here, which is how we load the encoder and how we actually just run things. So a lot of generics in the model type, which I aliased. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure how I feel about all these generics. That's quite a long type name. I have my opinions. Uh, but you load the model. You turn it into a runnable, which makes it into an Onyx graph. And then to do the actual inference, they have a T value type and a tensor type, and you wrap things in there, and then a T vec for a vector of tensors, and you give your tensors in order, and then you've done an inference, and 
it all works, and you have some like values coming out of the neural network which you can use. We then have ORT, which is bindings to C++ code. So here we have the edge of danger and wildness to which we live with of native code in our Rust stack. It's got decent performance, and it can also perform optimizations. The real-time factor on Hello World from Rust with all the optimizations turned off because I thought Onyx wasn't doing, uh, thought Trax wasn't doing any, so I turned it off to compare apples to apples a bit. Real-time factor was 2.7. When I turned on all the optimizations, it went down to more like 0.7. So big speed-ups if you turn on the optimizations. Um, really cool crate. Uh, this slide's actually changed a lot. When I started doing this talk, they were on version 1.0. You had to pass in the memory allocator you were using explicitly, whether you were using a, a C++ allocator, a Rust allocator, a GPU allocator. And I had a lot of complaints about it. But they've done version 2.0, and the API is so much nicer. Like, There's no mention of which allocator you're using. There's no passing pointers to allocators into things or whatever you're doing. But here is the code, and it's, it's not as verbose as the tracked code, and there's no like weird generics or anything that can scare people or give you pages and pages of error messages. I do think I do slightly prefer this as an API personally. And also, as well as letting you put your inputs in as a list of inputs, it lets you do them as named inputs, so tying to the names in the neural network to the value. I'll show you why that's important later, but that's a great bit of API. So my general thoughts are ORT API is lower. You're linking to C++ code, and you have to sometimes think about building that code and how you're going to build it in your system. That's painful in its own way sometimes. If it works, it works, and it's great. But sometimes like, you end up faffing a bit with C++ build systems, potentially, and like, if that's not your forte, um, you probably won't enjoy it too much. If it is your forte, you still won't enjoy it, actually. It's, uh, I can't pretend I enjoy messing with CMake or anything like that. Being able to specify inputs by name is really nice. They both use ND array, but Tract has a lot more wrapping into their tensor and T value types. I'm sure there's a technical justification for that. I haven't gone too deeply into it. But the wrapper types with Tract felt like a bit more friction in the API for just getting my data into the network. But I think Tract is still a good API. Like, I'm not trying to sound badder. Like, it is good. It works. It does what it wants to do well. Like, you'll be good choosing it either of them if they meet your performance concerns. So this is why named tensor inputs and outputs are useful. So as I mentioned before, the Tacatron 2 network is split into three separate networks. Now, there's a recurrent one that runs in a loop. This is why they split it into three networks, so that you can do this loop manually yourself. And this is all the state that the network keeps in the iterations, and you now have to pass that in manually. Now, if you're doing this without named inputs, you're looking at the graph in like Netron, and you're making sure that your variable names match the ordering in the UI and like in the graph. And it adds an extra weight to verifying that things are correct, especially since a bunch of these are the same dimension, so you won't get dimension mismatch warnings. Attention weights and attention weights come. They're the same size. If you mix them up and get them backwards, your network's going to generate gibberish, and you're going to wonder where it's gone wrong, potentially. So named inputs are super important. Uh, if you're working with networks of any amount of complexity, uh, you do really need these, or you need, like, very good tests. So this is something I wish Tract would have on the inference, but that's life. So we have three networks now. We need to manually run the decoder iterator, and the dynamic input dimension is fixed because of JIT tracing. So the outputs of Python and Rust don't look the same, like the code has diverged a bit too much. If we all kept it in one network and just kept it in and kept it out, it would probably be the same. But things have changed. So. They don't look the same, but they look close. So this is the spectrogram generated by Python, and this is the spectrogram generated by Rust. So as a brief explanation of what this is, the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is frequency. Higher is a higher frequency. So we can also see the strength of different frequencies and the speech and how they change over time. 
And then if we just go to my listening thing, so this is what the Python sounds like. Hello world from Rust. And this is what the Rust sounds like. Hello world from Rust. So it's still saying what it's meant to say. And for the purpose of this talk, that's fine with me. So moving onwards, do not trust researcher documentation. Tacatron 2's text processing says it can take uppercase and lowercase characters or alphabet phonemes. So I went into this expecting to use my phoneme code, which I spent so long working on, but the pre-trained models weren't trained with any phonemes, and we also weren't trained with capital letters. So that data going into the network is the network does not know what to do with it. And as such, when I put in my phonemes to say hello world from Rust, and see if you can hear hello world from Rust in this at all, because I got a gay 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 gay. And I thought I did something really wrong. Uh, yeah, the wrong thing I did was that I didn't like, I didn't train the network myself, and they don't actually note down very explicitly what how they train this and like what augmentations they do. You have to dig into the training code a bit yourself. Um, also. CMU dict is in capitals, so my text normalization was output in capital letters. They seemingly trained it on only lowercase because when I put in capital letters, hello world from Rust, I got. Yeah, uh, it can take a bit of debugging and like a bit of comparing between the Python and the Rust. It's a lot of backwards and forwards. It's definitely a process. But we have our spectrogram, and now we can finally start trying to turn this picture of a sound into an actual sound. And this is where we have the vocoder. So in the frequency domain, the spectrograms, we have what we call the magnitude and the phase information. So the magnitude is for each frequency, how strong is it in the signal? How big is it? The phase is more like if you're a sine wave or a cosine wave, it's a bit of offset. So the magnitude is quite easy to understand conceptually, and like you can look at it and you can kind of see what's happening. A phase suffers a lot from like wrap around, and you can't quite see the sounds from that. Um, yeah, it's much harder to train. I don't think anyone actually trains things to output phase spectra. So part of the vocoding is actually estimating the phase so that we can generate audio from it. So in the Tacatron 2 repo, we have the parameters for the MEL spectrograms that they generate for the training data and that the network will then generate. We can then use them and we can use them into a vocoder and generate sound. As a example, I have the linear spectrum, not a MEL spectrogram. I have the magnitude and the phase. We can see from the magnitude, we can see the shape of how the frequencies change in time, like it gets a bit higher and then it drops off. From the phase, I can't tell when a word begins or ends. I think if you can, like you should possibly submit yourself to study by scientists. Um, so yeah, this just illustrates why we tr use the magnitude uh, spectrum. So there are kind of two approaches, or there's a few different approaches. One approach is to use a neural network, which you train on the magnitude spectrum and the speech that generated that spectrum. And then it kind of learns the characteristics of a human voice, and it gets a bit better at making it sound like a human voice. Or you have signal processing, which is way, way too mathematical for me to like show everything and how it all works. But what we do is for general steps. So I should have mentioned we do Griffin Lim in this thing. It's a fairly well understood algorithm, well understood performance characteristics, but we convert from a MEL spectrogram to a linear spectrogram. So, like I mentioned before, the MEL spectrogram is essentially compression, and we're sticking things into buckets, so it's lossy compression. So, we have to go back to the spectrogram with more frequency information, not just based on our perception of sound. And for that, we have to do some like Nonlinear optimization. I really wanted to use argmin for this, but it uses like a very specific variant of some optimizer, which has only been implemented in C, but there's a crate with bindings to it. It's like LGBFSLB or something. 
it's in the code. I saw someone mouthing it, so I, um, yeah, I can check later. But we create the spectrogram. We then create the ran a random phase spectrum. We create a completely random matrix. And then we do a inverse Fourier transform to turn that back into audio. And then we turn it back into a spectrogram. This is an iterative process, so kind of what happens is we know our magnitude spectrum is correct because the neural networks are infallible, of course. But when we do the inverse transform back to audio, some of the information bleeds out, kind of goes from the magnitude and into the phase when we turn it back, and our magnitude and our phase spectrum will be different from when we started. So then we restore our original magnitude spectrum and keep the modified space, phase spectrum, and then we keep changing it and doing that again and again. And eventually we'll get something that when we do the inverse transform, the magnitude spectrum isn't changing. It's sort of converged on some point. And there's probably some like great mathematical proofs on why this works. Like there's, I kind of have an intuition for the maps. Like, like I said, like the information kind of shifts between the two and you go to some form of convergence. And we can listen to this, of course, and hear how things work. But for this sort of signal processing, nonlinear optimization code with a bunch of big matrices and all this complicated stuff, like how do we test it? So we go from a reference golden implementation. Like I said, this is a well-understood signal processing algorithm. Like there are implementations of it. And what you do is you take one of those, which is appropriately licensed. You break down each part of the pipeline. And you can generate the inputs, get the outputs, compare them. Comparing matrices of floats is painful. Like you can bring an ND array a prox and then do a, a CERT a prox equal on like a, a 300 by 80 uh, matrix, and your developers will hate you like when they're trying to bug fix on that. So we, I think on this crate, I ended up looping through all the values and reporting the first one where it went wrong. But the important thing that when you actually have the test fail, you want to detect it save a bunch of matrices to your file system, and then you can compare them to the matrices in some sort of plotting script or something that just makes it easier to introspect about the data and what it's doing. And actually, tasked with realistic inputs, I have met people who have done things like generated a random like matrix and put it through, not actually a magnitude spectrum, and they've got random noise coming out. It doesn't actually hit like branches or aspects of the code that you want to test. So you do want to like make sure your data is representative of your system, which is like an age-old adage. Your test data should kind of match what you're expecting to guess what you could feasibly get. And as you iteratively build up the pipeline, use unit testing to test your understanding of the system and the maths. You don't want to be implementing these algorithms ideally and then kind of go at the end of it and not understand how any of it works. If it doesn't work, you need to be able to fix it. And to do that, you need to understand it. So porting can be a great learning opportunity to learn a bunch of maths you haven't done since university and a chance to get back in with all the Fourier transforms and stuff. Who doesn't love that? So as a note from the implementation, we ported from Librosa. That is a Python audio processing library. It has tons and tons of features. It's very fully featured. It's never seen production. We implemented this so we would have something which has a known real-time factor, and we could compare against some newer neural vocoders we were experimenting with and like changes in our architecture. We kind of wanted to be like, well, is this competitive with like the, the simple, fast approach? Is it not? How does it compare on GPU versus CPU, et cetera? This crate has never seen production, and I've not published it onto Crates.io, but it is open source. It does have some unwraps in it. Um, it's, if you want to use it, you're free to. And while it is tested, it is less tested. So how does it sound? Well, Griffin Lim doesn't have a model on how human speech sounds. It just tries to do something simple and quick. As a result, like there are aliasing artifacts and the like in the audio. It kind of sounds a bit watery, but if I just play this, so it won't sound as nice as the first samples. They use the neural vocoder, very state of the art stuff. This is what the Griffin Lim one sounds like. Thank you for listening to my talk. 
So you can hear the speech, but it's got that kind of watery, warbly feeling. Um, just all Griffin Limaldio sounds like this, but at least like it's understandable as human speech. So now we have the links. So on my own repo, I've called it XDTTS because I'm bad at naming things. Um, sorry. On the Emotech Lab one, we have the SSML parser. So there's a lot of credits for writing SSML because that is a way you talk with third party TTS APIs. There's actually no crates for parsing it, and there's very few libraries for parsing it in the open source world because no one likes writing libraries to pass XML standards, and you're only interested in it if you're making a TTS system. So we've open sourced this, and we've also open sourced the Griffin Lim stuff plus tutorial. So I do have bonus content. Um, how good am I for time, Ernest? I'm great. I got through this a lot faster than I thought I would. Like, so if I, oh, I, I didn't expect to share my wallpaper. Love Godzilla. So yeah, in the Griffin Lim, am I, on, I am on Wi-Fi. Yeah, so we have bonus content. Who doesn't love bonus content? So I really wanted to talk about signal processing, but I knew the maths would like lose a lot of people. And I remember the lectures in uni being painful, looking at someone going, if you take the sum of like sine waves and cosine waves, you can make any periodic repeating signal. Um, we didn't come here for this. We came here for Rust. So I do have a tutorial that actually goes through a bit of the signal processing if you want to go more into that. And bonus content. Uh, we do naturally have the TTS code. All the slides are in here. Uh, there's content I had to cut. So I initially tried to do a network called Speedy Speech. and because of Onyx support, I had a lot of trouble with that. But I have inference code for candles, Onyx support, ORT, Torch, Tract. So you can find a wide variety of inference code for different frameworks. There are some frameworks missing. A lot of the Rust, pure Rust ML frameworks are very nascent. And some of them don't work, or they have like issues for some of the stuff I was trying to do. And I didn't want to put anyone on blast, like, oh, your crate doesn't work, mate. Like, what are you doing, bruv? Um, so I'm, if I haven't mentioned anyone, it's either because I haven't heard of them or things didn't quite work when I tried them. But I might have tried it a long time ago, so things could change, like look up in the world, like what's happening. And for the modules, I have doc comments on like how everything works. For the text normalizer, I've got a big write-up on text normalization, and I also cover things with different languages, like how to handle different writing systems, some of the challenges that come about with like Japanese or Arabic or Mandarin and all this stuff. And in the Tacotron 2 module, I have doc comments explaining sequence to sequence models and linking to papers and references and anything that you might want to look at in order to like further understand more about these architectures. I was initially going to look at doing some training stuff, so the training folders largely like data set analytics stuff. There's no training code, but you can like look at a data set like LJ Speech and see um, what the collection of die phones are, what the collection of phones are, like what the word, uh, how many else of vocabulary words there are compared to CMU dictionary. All these sorts of things that you do when doing like data exploration and training, just to try and understand what you're working with and like how you can potentially do things. And yeah, that's generally it. For the, obviously, we're going to have questions after this. But for the future, things I plan on doing, uh, there is a, right down, pop here at the corner, there's a fold file called TDP Solar. That is how to change the speed or pitch of audio without, so you can use it to change the speed of audio without changing the pitch, or change the pitch of audio without changing the speed. I am working on an implementation of that, so I can build in all the SSML support for changing the speeds and stuff. I do want to do a G2P model just to show that to the open source community. And I would probably like to try and throw in maybe a few more Melgen models just to like integrate more stuff. Um, I do plan on writing more about this and putting more stuff out, things which are suitable, aren't suitable for a conference talk, but are suitable for digesting in your own time. So yeah, hopefully this 
is educational for people. You can also dive into all the Rust code. I didn't show too much of it because I figure this is a very new domain for a lot of people, so you might want to just learn the problems that we're dealing with and a bit how we deal with them. But yeah.